Alrighty, we are in week three of our Show Me Your Jesus series, where we're looking at our Jesus and making sure that our Jesus lines up with the Jesus that we find in the Bible. Because as we've talked about, it's easy for us to just fixate on the things that we are favorite parts of Jesus, or, or it's easy for us to hear something that someone else believes about Jesus and be like, oh, that must be true. But we have to make sure that what we believe about who the God of the universe is, is who he says that he is. I'm still chewing on Pastor Heather's message from last week that, that yes, God does want me to be happy, but that is not his main goal. And as God wants the best for me, sometimes his idea of best is different than mine. That his idea of best means I have to go through some stuff so that I come out better in the future. As we talk about Jesus, have, have you ever had a conversation with someone and, and they're like, yeah, but, but what about how angry God is in the Old Testament? He seems a little grumpy over there. How do, how do you feel about the Old Testament and some of those stories that is in there? What is your reply when someone says that? I know there are some good-meaning, Jesus-loving folk who, who go, yeah, well, that, that, was, that was the old stuff. Jesus changed his mind in the New Testament. Or there are some people that are like, you know what? Like, the Old Testament, like, it, it's good and everything, but, but sometimes I, I just wish that I could just, you know, just like tear a little bit of the Bible out of there and just get rid of that. Don't worry, I didn't actually rip the Bible. What are your views on God in the Old Testament and Jesus? Because some people might say, well, my Jesus isn't the angry Old Testament God. But is he? Is Jesus the same from the book of Genesis to the end of Revelation? So as you can imagine, we're going to be jumping around a little bit this morning. Don't worry, we're not covering the entire Bible. But we're going to start in the book of Exodus. Moses is on Mount Sinai. The people have come out of Egypt, and Moses gets to hear from God, and he gives him the Ten Commandments, and then God describes who he is. And in Exodus 34, starting in verse 6, it says, And he, being God, passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and the fourth generation. So God starts out his introduction to Moses. This is who I am. And any time in the Old Testament you see it says Lord and it's all caps, big L, big O, big R, big D, uh, that is our English way of, of saying Yahweh. And instead of writing out the word Yahweh, that is showing us, well, we just put all caps Lord. So when God describes himself to Moses, he says, Yahweh, Yahweh, that is who I am. And he starts out with positive things. I am compassionate. I am gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining my love to thousands, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. All good things, I would argue, things that we find in the New Testament. But then sometimes you can get a little caught up when then we get to the end, and it's like, oh, hold on, but does not leave the guilty unpunished, and I will make sure to deal with multiple generations if that's what it takes. So what do we learn about God? God is multifaceted. God is allowed to have multiple different emotions. Sometimes we think God is a one-trick pony, but he's not. I am full of love, but sometimes we got to deal with stuff. When there is injustice, we are going to deal with that. 
And sometimes that means dealing with it when you pass on bad stuff to your kids and your kids are replicating what you did. There are some times later on in Israel's history that it says that, that the children were even worse off than their parents. That when there was a king, well, that king was bad, but then his son came to power and he made what dad looked like, made it look like child's play. And God says, when you pass on the bad stuff, I'm going to deal it with you, I'm going to deal it with your kid, I'm going to deal with it with your grandkid. Because justice does not just go for one thing, justice is all-encompassing. It's going to the root of the problem, it's dealing with things. We're going to jump now to 2 Samuel chapter 6. We've jumped ahead in time to now David has become king of Israel. And they are moving the Ark of the Covenant to the capital city. And we're going to read it, and then we're going to go back and explain what, what's going on here. So, starting in verse 1, David again brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000 people. He and his men went to Bala in Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. They set the ark on to a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it and Ahio was walking in front of it. David and all Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord, with castanets, with harps, with lyres, with timbrels, with sistrums, and with cymbals. But when they came to the threshing floor of Nakon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. And Yahweh's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down, and he died there beside the ark of God. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah, and to this day that place is called Perez Uzzah. Yikes. When stuff like this happens, we need to ask ourselves the question, and we need to answer the question, why is God angry? Because David gets angry at God, and, and we're kind of left with the question, seems like Uzzah did a good thing. The, the oxen are stumbling. The ark might fall off of the cart. I'm going to reach out, and I'm going to save it. Smack down. Struck dead by God. Kind of felt like he did a good thing. So why is God angry? It's important to answer that question because it's easy for us to say, oh, God was angry, bad God, move on with our lives. When my wife is angry, I don't just look over at her, and I can say this because she left the room, I don't just look over at her and be like, huh, she's angry, move on with my life. We have a relationship, and so I try and figure out what's going on. Is there something that I have done to affect this mood? What's going on here? So what is going on here? Well, there's actually a lot that's going on here. Number one, uh, previously, Israel had lost the Ark of the Covenant because they weren't playing by God's rules. They thought that there was something special about the box. When we have the God box with us, we can't lose. It wasn't about God. It was about we got the thing. And so they took it into battle with them, and they got spanked royally. And the Ark gets taken away, and then the, the bad guys who took it, well, they get spanked by God too. And so they send it back. They're like, we want nothing to do with this box because it's cursed. Send it back to Israel. It reached this guy, Abinadab's house, and he's like, hey, cool, God's box. I'll keep it at my house. So Israel had messed up by not keeping, rec recognizing how important it was and keeping it in the right spot. They just left it at this dude's house. So now David is like, I want to bring it into the capital city. God's presence with my presence, it's going to be great. And so what do they do? They come and they put it on a cart. And now you could make the argument that scripture tells us it was a new cart. So they were like, oh, God is important. We're going to put it in the new cart. 
But God had given very specific instructions. When you move the Ark of the Covenant, only one people group can do it, the tribe of Levi. They are the only ones that can touch this thing. And even then, they are going to touch it with poles. And they're going to stick these poles through these loops that are on the Ark of the Covenant. And then they are going to hold it on their shoulders and they are going to walk. Now, the reason that that happens is because the Ark of the Covenant is going to give us the idea of this is God's throne here on earth. What did scripture said? He is enthroned. He is sitting on the throne between the cherubim, the golden angels that are on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And so in the same way that other peoples of their time would have, I forget the name of it, but you'd have the thing where the king sits on the throne and you have his little lackeys that are holding him up and walking around. In cartoons, it's always a fat guy for some reason. But that was the point of the Ark of the Covenant. This is God's throne amongst his people. You treat him with respect and honor and only certain people carry it by these poles. They put it on a cart. You know what? It's just God's box. Throw it on the cart and let's go. They were not listening to what God required. Not only that, because of this, they're in a situation where this thing is going to fall. If someone's holding it, that thing ain't falling. It's on a cart, it's bumpling, it's jostling, and it falls. And Uzzah, who is not of the tribe of Levi, is not supposed to touch this thing, responds and touches it. So why is God angry? Because the God of the universe and the king of Israel is being completely disrespected and not listened to. He warns them time and time again, if you don't do these simple things, bad stuff is going to happen. And why is this happening right now? It's not just a, there's five people watching, and if someone does something wrong, it's okay, they get a free pass. We're told that there's 30,000 men watching this event. If God does not act in this thing and people think, well, God gives commands, but we don't have to follow them, what's going to happen? God needs to follow through on his word so that as everyone watches this scene, 30,000 people understand God is the God of the universe and you follow through what he tells you to do. So what about Jesus? We jump ahead to the New Testament, and sure, we have some stories of of Jesus flipping a table, calling Peter Satan, getting upset with things, But, but we don't see Jesus responding exactly in the same way that we see God in the Old Testament. We don't see Jesus walk up to something and go, boom, you're dead, boom, you're dead. No, Jesus isn't acting like that. But what do we see in Revelation chapter 3? The book of Revelation starts out with John the Apostle is writing down letters to very specific churches in the region of what we now know as present-day Turkey. And the majority of these letters are not positive, hey, good job, everybody. A lot of these letters are Jesus isn't happy letters, the the type of letter you don't want to get from Jesus. And so Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 14, to the angel or pastor of the church in Laodicea write, these are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you are either one or the other, so because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, blind, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and I discipline. So be earnest and repent. See, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit on my throne. 
just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We need to understand that God's mad is righteous. That when God is angry about something, he has the right to be. I wish that I could say the same thing. I wish I could say that every time I get frustrated or mad, Pastor Mark is being mad about the right thing. No, my anger a lot of the times is unrighteous. And the problem is, is that our idea of anger does not always line up with what God says is right. What are the things that we see God get mad about? We see him get mad about sin. We, get, we see him get mad about injustice. When, when, when a, a crime has been committed and the people get off scot-free and the people that are supposed to make sure that that stuff happens turn a blind eye. We see God get upset when things aren't the way that he designed them to be. This was my design. This was my desire for you. And you've gone off the deep end. Now we have to deal with this. So in Revelation, we have to ask ourselves, why is Jesus upset with the church in Laodicea? He says, you're lukewarm. You're like water that's been left out in the sun for a few days. And I drink it and I go, don't like the taste of that. I wish that you were either hot or cold. And some people interpret that as either like on fire or like so-so with Jesus or, or anti-Jesus. But uh, geography tells us that a lot of stuff that Jesus mentions here actually has to do with Laodicea. And there were other cities in the region that were famous for their cold water. And another city that was famous for their hot spring. Both good things. You want nice cold water and you want nice warm water to sit in. So it's probably not hot and cold on the way that we would think of hot and cold. But Jesus is like, I wish that you were on one end of the spectrum, either like this or like that, but you're in the middle. And that sickens me. And when he says, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth, others translate that as vomit. It's not just like a patooey, it is a... You're in me, but you're not of me, and I'm going to get rid of you. That doesn't sound like very nice, inclusive Jesus. Jesus says, be something. Be passionate about me. Otherwise, hit the road, Jack, because you're not really here. And that's a whole other sermon where we can talk about losing your salvation. We'll save that for another day. But the point is, Jesus cares. And Jesus gets upset about things. And what does he say? Those whom, I those whom I love, I rebuke and I discipline. We talked about last week, trials and sufferings. Jesus might define some of those things happening because we got some rough edges that need some sanding off. You need to understand that this sin that you're holding on to is not good, and I'm going to keep poking you until you get rid of it. I stand at the door and knock. If you open it, I will come in and eat with you. Un unlike our, our Exodus passage where it started great and then got a little, uh, here we see Jesus starting off uh, and then ending great. Hey, if you come back to me, victory is promised. And not just victory, but you get to sit on my throne. He doesn't say you get your own throne. Come and sit with me, the king. We're going to rule together. And that's a lot of the book of Revelation. Hey, if we make this through, if we make it through, Jesus has promised, just as the Father has appointed me to do these things, so I choose you. Old Testament, New Testament, we're seeing a lot of similarities. I think my Jesus might be the same God of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, God says, I, Yahweh, do not change. In the book of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews in chapter 13, verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. We're noticing a pattern. From the beginning to the end, we got consistency. But the reality is, is that God expresses him expresses himself differently at different times. When Jesus came to this earth, did he tell us 
why he came. I would argue that he did. Luke chapter 19, verse 10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He said, this is why I'm here for this trip. This is my goal, to seek and to save the lost. But what does all of Scripture say? That was part one. Part two, he comes back, and it's not to seek and to save the lost. Part two is to establish his kingdom to put down the people that are against him and to establish the everlasting kingdom of God. So just like people, God is multifaceted. He's allowed to have different emotions at different times throughout human history. Sometimes we forget that this book is God operating in human history over the course of thousands of years. To us, we read it, and, and we're, we're absorbing it and we're everything, and it seems like, wow, God was mad on that day and that day, and we forget God has been dealing with people for hundreds of years, and they have been rebellion, 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 rebellion. I'm surprised he didn't act sooner. The Hebrew language, when it says slow to get angry, the, the word for anger is also the word for nose. And you can imagine that sometimes when people get angry, you get red in the face and your nose gets a little red. And so when God says, I am slow to anger, that phrase is literally, I am long-nosed. You can think of Pinocchio, if you will. God says, here is my nose, and it will take me a long time to get angry with you. But there is a tip to the nose. There is a time when God says, okay, you've had enough time. We're dealing with this. Like a parent, there are times of love and blessing. There are times when God is bringing restoration, and there are times of rebuke. A rhetorical question for all of us. What do you think God feels about the United States of America? Just think to yourself. What what do you think, knowing the entirety of the Bible... And what God expects of human beings, both those who follow him and those that don't. How do do you think God feels about this nation? And I'm not going to answer that question. Because God has dealt with so many different nations all throughout human history. And for those of us who went through the book of Daniel recently, we've seen how God makes kingdoms rise and fall. And for us, it's like, whoa, whoa. The, the Greek Empire with Alexander the Great, that, that was a big deal. And God was like, yeah, I just needed them to do this one thing, and then they're off the map. And sometimes we think that, that God is saying yes to all of these things, and God is saying yes to his plan. Because the reality is, is that God is consistent and will fulfill his word. And his word is about his plan. And so when we look at the world around us, we have to remember God is the same in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, and today. To know the heart of God, you need to know God. And to know God, you need to know his word. It's been great as we've been exploring a little bit more of the Old Testament in our Wednesday morning Bible studies because we've been looking and seeing, wait a minute, I didn't realize how much of the New Testament there is in the Old Testament. And and understanding that if I know who God is from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, as I look at the world around me, I understand a little bit more about what God's doing. I understand a little bit more of what God expects from my life. So what's our next step? What is the next step for you when it comes to understanding who our Jesus is? For some of us, it might be to know God better opening up his word, pouring through that, and being like, God, I want to know who you are. Reveal yourself in greater and greater measures. For others, it might be telling people who we know our Jesus to be. You you hear someone say, well, I don't think uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament, different gods. And we could say, no, look. Look at the entire story. Look and see that it is the same, that the God of love is through the entire book. And the God of justice is through the entire book as well. 
We need to help people understand when their view of Jesus is skewed, that's not the real Jesus. And for others of us, we just need to respond to those two truths. We need to respond and and change the way that we think about who God is. I'd like to invite the worship team to come to the front. Scott's going to come and help me pass out communion, but let me pray. Jesus, I thank you that you are consistent. I thank you that you are God from creation to the end of eternity, which has no end. I thank you, Jesus, that just as you have always existed, so the qualities that you exhibit to us will always exist. There is no end to your love. There is no end to your grace and to your mercy. Jesus, you are full of all of these attributes, and you give of them abundantly. So Jesus, would you help us to love you and worship you in your entirety? We don't just want to fixate on the stuff that is our favorite about you. We want to celebrate every single part of you, God, because you are beautiful in your entirety. And Jesus, as we understand more of who you are, I pray that we would understand more of who we were made to be. That just as you are love, we are called to love others. As you are a God of grace and mercy, that we are called to extend extend those same things to those around us. Would you be with us today, Jesus? It's in your name we pray. Amen.